officer. I would like to report four bodies in my backyard. You all right? Wait right there, Mr. Benu. How do you know my name? Hang up, Matthew. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell him my name. The Invasion of the Body Snatchers might be one of my favorite science fiction stories of all time, built around its simple but provocative premise of the human race slowly being repopulated by an alien race of pods that travel the galaxy from planet to planet. Of all the retellings, Philip Kaufman's adaptation of Jack Finney's Alien Invasion classic personally ranks amongst some of the best cinematic remakes ever told. As a starter, the film's star-studded ensemble cast carries a lot of the film's weight, featuring Donald Sutherland's health inspector Matthew Bennell, Brooke Adams' Elizabeth Driscoll as the paranoid scientist, and quite possibly Leonard Nimoy's best screen performance as a suspicious psychiatrist among others. The characters butt heads and clash ideas to make sense of the spreading chaos in their once palpable civilization, and one by one, their inevitable fate draws closer. Despite the far-fetched concept, the film's insidious atmosphere makes the scenario frighteningly plausible. The world through this lens is tighter, disjointed, and uncomfortably cornered, but Kaufman's teasing of the story and its uneasy atmosphere make for a deeply creepy experience. It has, uh, it has the 70s kind of down, you know, the sort of 70s San Francisco scene where, it, where uh, uh, it's, it's hard to know whether someone is a part or whether they're just a sort of, you know, 70s asshole. And, uh, and what's his name is a, is a psychiatrist and you can't know whether, you know, for a long while you don't know whether he's really a part or he's just a psychiatrist and it turns out he's both. And the scar was gone. No! It's still there. Of course, it's still there. What did you expect? It's still ten. It's Excuse me, husband. can I just say Please. one thing? I have to especially commend Ben Burtt's effectively eerie soundscape, which adds immeasurably to the film's suffocating quality with its otherworldly bleeps and electronic warbling. Even the special effects, something that traditionally dates many 70s movies, are suitably disturbing, particularly during one of the film's most memorable moments, as Sutherland's character comes face to face with his embryonic double. The others! W.D. Richter's script takes the same familiar setup and creates a disquieting paranoid thriller informed by the conspiracy theories of the period and the jaded cynicism that followed the death of the counterculture movement. The base of his writing is no doubt derived from the Cold War-infused hysteria of the 1958 classic, which primarily pit one man against the world. Now we have a version that taps into the fears of contemporary society and carefully charts the beginning of an emotional apocalypse in American culture. Somewhere down the line, long-term relationships become the crux of this pod invasion, where everyone feels that a friend, partner, or spouse has indeed changed. Think about how often divorcees demonize their former spouses in the cultural turn of 70s America. Suddenly they're different, terrible, maybe not even human. This has nothing to do with the man that I live with. It has everything to do with it, don't you see? People are stepping in and out of relationships too fast because they don't want the responsibility. That's why marriages are going to hell. The whole family unit is shot to hell. David, you're not listening to what she's saying. Matthew, please stay out of this. You see, that's the point. I'm listening to you, but he doesn't think I am. Why? Because he doesn't expect me to bother enough or to care. This spreading meltdown is used to the advantage of the emotionless pods who consume the Earth's population. Their meticulous method is to repopulate when we're at our most vulnerable, when we're asleep. In order to survive and to continue the human race, we need to sleep at some point. We need our mind and body to rest in order to function the next day. The pods knew this, and humans gave them everything they needed. This in turn begs the question, if a society grew so paranoid to the point that they were seeing a whole new reality, how did our main characters not see this invasion coming from a mile away? The short answer is the power of irrationality. We humans like to think of ourselves as rational beings, but we overwhelmingly make decisions on gut instinct, and then invent reasons to justify those decisions after the fact. How did you feel? You were probably shocked. You wanted to shut your feelings off, withdraw, maybe make believe that it wasn't happening because then you don't have to deal with it. That isn't to say all of our decisions are irrational. If your car was running low on gas, the most sensible solution is to fill it up with more to continue driving. 
Or if you have an early morning appointment, no one would question why you would want to send an alarm to wake up on time. In the grand scheme, however, purchases are often impulse buys. Children and teens do not see school or the future in rational ways, and crimes are often crimes of passion or desperation. If we were pure, rational beings, there'd be no place for love, hate, or any need to feel for that matter. We'd put aside any connection or difference that could spark war, corruption, poverty, celebration, or question. We would simply exist. I hate you. We don't hate you. There's no need for hate now. Or love. I love you, Matthew. There are people that will fight you, David. They'll stab you. In an hour. You won't want them to. Invasion of the Body Snatchers is timeless in its depiction of dissatisfaction with alienation. It is more than an allegory for cultural and emotional apocalypse that the era it uses as a base. It is ultimately a parable against conformity.